We've all, at one point or another in our lives, usually while visiting Cornwall, gone through days which, on balance, we'd really rather forget. Just last week, whilst watching the Discovery Channel, I heard the story of a man who was rock climbing in California, high in the Sierra Nevada mountains, for whom the day was a bad one. I shall not divulge fully. In essence, it was a warm and sunny day. He set out with little more than a rope and a small pocket knife, and all was going well. Unfortunately, though, whilst he was about halfway up one of the mountain's many cliff faces, it started to rain. In the wet, he slid out of just about every crevice that he managed to fit his foot into, and on one occasion his rope slackened and he fell about 28 feet before coming to a sharp, uncomfortable rest on a ledge which jutted out of the side of his cliff. His left shoulder had been cracked and all the fingers on his right hand had been snapped backwards on the fall. So there he lay for a few minutes and then, in a series of unfortunate events, a boulder broke off of the cliff and trapped his leg. So, miles from anywhere with a broken skeleton, he reckoned that his only chance of survival rested on him being able to get the knife out of his pocket, and I want to stress at this point that this was for real, and cut off his own leg. Not what you'd call a nice day. Now, realistically, that is never going to happen to me, not in Scotland anyway. Over here, there are far worse scenarios than personal surgery in the mountains. Sometimes, though, as many of us know all too well, things can be even worse than that. This is what happened to me. It was a beautiful, warm Sunday in mid-July, and all was well with the world outside my front door. Inside, though, things were more frantic. I am, without doubt, one of the least punctual people in the world. Those who know me well understand that when I say something like, I'll be there at around half five, what I actually mean is I'll be there at around quarter past six. Today, though, I had promised Matthew that I'd be ready in time. We planned to go biking, and this time it was my job to plan the route for a diminutive yet epic road trip. Well, I thought, strolling down my driveway, this should be easy. Perhaps it was the weather, or perhaps it was just the satisfaction of knowing that we'd soon be at the start of what could have been our best and most comical trip yet. But there was an air of confidence surrounding me, and indeed the whole thing. Something which, once the trip was over, I certainly didn't think I would ever feel again. I pulled feverishly at the handle of the garage access. It rattled somewhat, and the rest of the cul-de-sac echoed to the gruesome metal-to-metal -metal screeches of what B and Q call a door. I looked around quickly from side to side to try and find a way in, as the door seemed to be thoroughly broken. I remembered the window round the other side of the garage, which I had left opened earlier that day. Perfect, I thought sarcastically. I'll just climb in the window, like an idiot. Fortunately, though, in many aspects, I am an idiot, and I had no problem blending in with the task at hand. Once inside, I unlocked my bike and used it to ram the garage door opened. I was greeted outside by blinding daylight and screams of hilarity. You look like such an idiot. He fell over laughing. Ah, Matthew, I murmured. Truth be told, I wasn't actually ready for him at all, and here he was now, a few minutes early, in pain laughing as I half jumped, half fell out of the garage. Later, I found out that he had actually expected me to be ready. The fool. I dusted myself off, and he stood up to face me. I decided to speak, although I knew he would certainly interrupt with yet another cringingly inept wisecrack. I, er... Uh, I'm an idiot, he interrupted. I clenched my fists and looked in another direction, through the tight and slits that were now my eyes. At the time I could think of nothing better to say, so I looked back at him. I hate you. I know. We should probably at that point have discussed plans and tactics, but we got sidetracked and spent the following hour talking about utter nonsense. Eventually, after our nonsensical chatter, we began to prepare. All right, I said, I'll run some things past you that we might need, and you tell me if we have them. Sustenance of any kind? No. A bag with baking gear in it, you know, stupid clothes, stupid hats, fluorescent gloves? No. A lengthy silence followed. All right, let's move on. Finally, we could hit the road, or whatever it is they say in the world of baking. We had decided to set off from my house cross through the field behind my house and then blast down my new neighbour's driveway. My neighbour's drive is not yet finished, it's just a huge steep hill. 
So, once we had crossed through the field and beaten our way through the vegetation, we arrived at what has got to be the most fantastic driveway in all of human history. Just looking at it gave me visions of some catastrophic accident in which one of us would crash into the other at high speed and we would both be killed to death. At the same time, though, it did look quite a lot of fun. I took hold of the handlebars with my now sweaty palms, my stomach tightened and my heart began to pound. I looked over at Matthew, who seemed suitably terrified by the prospect of it all. Don't worry, Matthew. You probably won't even go that fast anyway. Listen, Tor, the last time you said something like that was in the Flume Tower in Kinghorn, and that slide was neither gentle nor peaceful. He glared back at me as he set off. If I die, I'll come back to haunt you. His voice faded as he rode further down the driveway. The occasional narrations of cussing were only just recognisable over the powerful torrent of wind tearing against him and his bike. It was time to go. I kicked up my bike stand and set off. I was expecting the speed to build up gradually like it does in, say, a train. But I was exceedingly wrong on that one. As it turned out, once you set off down the hill, the bike falls away from underneath you like it's been dragged down by a ton weight. The driveway is rough as well. There are gaping potholes and tall ridges, easily capable of breaking a bike's wheel and sending the occupant flying. As it gains speed, the hard but crumbling surface caused the bike to vibrate violently, sending shockwaves up my already weakened spine. It was only then when I thought about reaching for the brakes. To hell with it, I shouted aloud. There were only about a hundred feet left. The bike, which felt more like a moving, pale driver at this point, was weaving briskly from side to side. As a result of the vibrations, my vision became blurred. Thankfully, though, this didn't last long, and I careered off the hill and began to brake hard. When I caught up with Matthew, we discussed our options. The sun glinted down through the vast billowing white cloud. A gentle and welcome crosswind whipped slowly across me and my bike, whistling as it drifted through the gearbox. I had decided, after a look around, that our options were open. Weldon shared my sentiments, so we rode down to Ockenstaddy Quarry, along the road over the 17th Canal Bridge from Falkirk, and finally down into the Boathouse, a new restaurant in the Canal Basin. It was there that we decided to go along the canal for another few miles, and then perform a sort of U-turn and come back on a brand new road that snakes through the forest on the lower end of Bar Hill. Clouds had started to move in, but we thought nothing of them, so out we went again, riding along the unpleasantly dull bank of the Forth and Clyde Canal. It was only once we entered the thick forest that the day began to change, and change rapidly. There was no rain at first, but the sky went dark like someone had dragged a thick duvet over the sun. We pulled over momentarily to admire the incredible sky, which seemed to be almost otherworldly. It was then that a ferocious lightning storm began. So we decided to leave rather quickly. We ran back to our bikes, and for the first time in my life I was slightly confused as to what had happened to the weather. It was a beautiful sunny day five minutes ago, and in that space of time the blue airbrushed sky had turned into a seemingly vast electrical storm which stretched out further than we could see. We shot out of the forest and down the path that leads to an old oak tree and then back to the boathouse, back to shelter. But still, I observed, no rain. I stopped briefly as a memory returned to me. It was a few years previously when I had last seen such a huge storm. Then I was inside and I saw how the clouds gathered, and only after about an hour did the rain plummet onto the earth. A horrible feeling came over me. I was tense and deep in thought. My hair was getting slightly damp. Blast! It was raining only slightly, though, so I could still cycle on and catch Matthew. I cycled on, and in fact found that Matthew had fallen off and was now waiting on me from underneath his bike. Normally, our motto is, if a friend falls, then leave him there. But today, that didn't really seem appropriate, somehow. I helped him up, and just as he got back to his feet, rain thundered down, the type of rain so heavy that you can hear as well as feel. You remember that scene in Jurassic Park? Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum, and the other one, upside down in an old Land Rover Defender, the Tyrannosaurus is kicking about outside, yes? That's the kind of rain we're dealing with here. We quickly jumped on our bikes and tried to ride off. We got to the boathouse, but the visibility was so poor that we could barely see your hand in front of your face. Still, at least now we would be dry. At least that was what we thought. We entered the foyer and stood in out of the rain, which grew ever more heavy and thick as time passed. We were soaked by this point, but little did we know that our troubles had only just begun. The restaurant's manager appeared and told us that if we didn't get out of his foyer, he would call the police and we'd be sent to prison for twenty years. So we went back outside. 
We decided that because it was now raining hailstones, and because we were both dressed in nothing more than t-shirts and shorts, that we would make a last desperate race through my neighbour's driveway, through the field, up the few streets, and back to my house. We made it to the foot of my neighbour's driveway before rain, hailstones, and just simply the cold became too much for both of us, and we had to shelter under a tree. When there's little to watch on the TV, I often find myself watching survival programmes that feature all the time on National Geographic. They can be terrible, I admit, but now finally I could put my extensive knowledge of survival into practice. Actually, I remember next to nothing, and all that I did know was that about desert island survival. Oh well, I thought. I shall just have to die. I felt sick, I felt cold, my arms, legs, face and body were numb. All I could genuinely feel was the back of my head. And it hurt. So, battered by hailstones and torn apart by wind, we picked up our bikes and attempted to haul them back home. The whole journey was a strangely dehumanising experience. It actually helped at some points to think of yourself as a machine rather than a person, and all you had to think about doing was pressing on, edging closer to home. I, believe it or not, have considerably shortened this story. We actually spent about five hours on the road, three and a half of which were some of the most difficult I have ever endured. But this is a story of two halves. One is what we went through physically on the road, being pummeled by the elements, and the other is of the ridicule we received from friends and family once we came home. This is roughly how it ended. We had been savaged by the immense thunderstorm still powering away overhead, sheet lightning being brushed away across the sky. A tropical wind blew around furiously, and my world was, as it had been for the last few hours, thrown into oblivion, but despite the rain, the hailstones, Thomas, the manager, and conditions that Ranulph Fiennes would have struggled in, we had done it. We had clocked a five-hour round trip, and now we were back in the street from where we had left off. We stopped at the side of the road, feeling like a cold, wet, ridiculous version of Michael Palin. I looked at Matthew. My linen jacket had been ruined, as had my shoes, and my trousers, and my hair. The only thing that hadn't been right, amazingly, was my iPhone, which is usually the first thing to die. The wind howled, making speech a hopeless endeavour, but I tried anyway. That's not going well, has it? What? Never mind. What? I walked on up my garage door, where my dad was standing. He found the sight of the two of us dripping wet, freezing, and as white as chalk, extremely funny. For weeks afterwards, he still broke down and laughed at every time it was mentioned. At the time, I found this rather annoying. But I suppose that the image of us as drowned rats is rather funny, and I forgave him for his mocking of us. To be honest, I couldn't really have known that it would come to that. For all we knew, it was just another nice day. Perhaps we could have done with some waterproof coats, though. With hindsight, I guess I would have stayed inside. But at least I have another humorous story to add to my life's collection. Henceforth, I conclude in the words of Mark Twain. If this has taught me anything, it's that challenges make life interesting. However, overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. To which, through experience, I can now add, provided it doesn't end in the process. <laughs>